It's therefore now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Today we are joined by correctional officers and staff from around the province. They are here to tell you about the growing crisis in corrections, a crisis that this government continues to ignore. The poor quality of Ontario's jails and their persistent lockdowns are putting correctional officers' lives at risk. We've already had an officer taken hostage at the Thunder Bay Jail, and the government's response was minimal. Mr. Speaker, how many more correctional officers have to be injured? How many more correctional officers have to be taken hostage before we see serious action from this government? Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And first of all, I want to uh, I want to welcome the uh, officers to the legislature today. And uh, I know that the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is going to want to uh, say more, Mr. Speaker. But um, you know, we are we're committed to transformation in corrections in Ontario. It is uh, it is. Uh, what we believe in, Mr. Speaker. It's why we're hiring more officers. Since uh, 2013, we've hired 710 new correctional officers, Mr. Speaker. We'll be hiring 2,000 more correctional officers over the next three years. We understand that there is a need for more personnel, Mr. Speaker. We also understand that there is uh, a need for support for training, and we've, uh, we've trained an additional 138 new correctional officers. Those, those trainings are, are underway, Mr. Speaker. But beyond that, we recognize Answer. that there is a need for uh, for an overall look at how we how we approach it, uh, corrections in this province and uh, that that is underway Thank mr you. speaker mr speaker back to the premier I remind the Premier of my visit to the Thunder Bay Correctional Facility. I could not believe the working conditions could exist in Ontario like I saw at the Thunder Bay Jail. The mayor of Thunder Bay called it a rat hole. The infrastructure in our correctional facilities in many parts of the province are completely inadequate. I'm sure the Premier would never work in these conditions that I saw. And so I repeat for the third time my challenge and question to the Premier. As I've done before, I'm asking the Premier. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier visit the jail in Thunder Bay, the correctional facility in Thunder Bay, to truly appreciate the conditions? And if Thunder Bay is too far, will the Premier visit any correctional facility? Because it's not good enough to say you went four or five years ago for ribbon cutting. Will you see the conditions today? Question. Yes or no? Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know, the reason that the transformation is underway, the reason officers are being hired, the reason that in the minister's mandate letter there is a focus on transformation in corrections is that I have already visited, Mr. Speaker. I understand that there is a, a real need for change in corrections, Mr. Speaker. I also recognize that uh, in, this, in this country, Mr. Speaker, provincial, uh, provincial jurisdictions are Order, working please. under challenging circumstances. Given, what, given decisions that were made at the federal level, Mr. Speaker, we need to focus on how we, how we prepare uh, people who are in our corrections uh, institutions for reintegration into society, Mr. Speaker. We need to make sure that the conditions that corrections officers are working in Answer. are safe, Mr. Speaker. That's why the transformation is the focus of the uh, ministers and that of the minister, and that's why the transformation is underway, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. A visit years and years ago isn't good enough. And I repeat my challenge. Will the Premier visit a correctional facility in the near future? Now, there's a simple first step, a first, a first step solution that I could recommend to the Premier. The body scanners in the Toronto South Detention Center should be in every correctional facility in Ontario immediately. You know, Mr. Speaker. During my visit to the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, I was told from a correctional officer that the smuggling of drugs is rampant. 17 kinder eggs from, from, from one, uh, one inmate full of drugs. I've heard in other correctional facilities about ceramic knives being smuggled in. Smokey Thomas has called on the government to take a task force beyond just Ottawa, but for the whole province. This is a reasonable proposition that the government should follow. And so my question, Mr. Speaker, is will the government take real meaningful steps, like setting up a, a task force, like having these body scanners, question. not next year, but immediately? Will you do the right things? Will you take these steps this spring? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, the Premier referred to the Minister of Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. Speaker, on this side of the House, uh, we've been very uh, absolutely been clear on this issue that the status quo in our correctional system cannot continue. And we are very much focused on working along with our correctional partners. And the fact that they're here and the fact that we actually have been having very productive meetings demonstrates that we are focused on, on developing solutions. And, Speaker, uh, let me be very clear. Our solutions are not what, what the leader of the opposition, when he sat along with Harper government and brought on dumb on crime policies, that has resulted in the kind of uh, challenges uh, in, uh, in overcrowding that we're seeing. That is not the solution, Speaker, that we're talking about. Neither are we are talking about the solutions that, that the Conservatives brought by private jails in this province, Speaker. Those are not the solutions we are talking about. I invite Answer. the member opposite. Stop the rhetoric and start talking about concrete solutions that is going to result in ensuring. Thank you. New question. The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. When the Premier was scribbling her new plan on the back of a napkin at her kitchen table, there was one glaring omission. And I appreciate that the Premier has no interest in input or consultation with other parties or Stop the clock. Uh, start the clock. It's very difficult to ask one side to come to order when the other side is provoking. So if you were to stop, I would be able to do something about it. Please finish your question. Mr. Speaker, I realize input is not welcome. It's the Liberal Party's way, it's the Premier's way, or the highway. But one glaring omission is about lobbying reform. Over the last 13 years, there has been a steady stream of staff leaving the Premier's and Minister's offices to become influential lobbyists. Lobbyists who, in turn, wrote big checks to the Liberal Party from their Deputy new House employers. Leader. Although she claims that the Premier will put a stop to the donations, it doesn't solve all the problems. It's inadequate. It's short. Mr. Speaker, when the cash dries up, what is Question. stopping Liberal friends from influencing the government's decisions? Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the uh, Opposition knows that we have made changes in terms of uh, the rules surrounding lobbyists, and one of the questions that, uh, that we have before us is, are there other changes that, uh, that need to be made? Mr. Speaker, I would, I would be happy to hear from the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition the from he has proposals on how he thinks, uh, how he thinks the, uh, the lobbyist process, the lobby, lobbying process should be changed, but Mr. Speaker, we have made changes. We have tightened up those rules. be happy to hear any input that he has on that. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, um, maybe the Premier forgot the, the page of her napkin on her kitchen table. Uh, and I understand, I understand that lobbying is legitimate. Order. But a simple cooling off period between leaving a minister's office and working as a lobbyist makes sense. That's the standard practice in other provinces. In all I guess maybe my signaling that I'm going after individuals hasn't come through yet, but uh, I reverse my politeness to a heavy hand. I don't care to do it, but I will. Please. Mr. Speaker, it appears I've touched a sensitive topic uh, of defending Liberal lobbyists. Uh, we can't have senior staff advising the Premier today and then lobbying for policy changes tomorrow. There has to be a cooling off period. Mr. Speaker, if the Premier's reform plan is so comprehensive, why has she been so silent on changing the lobbying rules in our province? Why leave these giant loopholes in the reform? Thank you. meeting that I had with the uh, leaders of the opposition parties, I said to them that I was interested in hearing from them on specific changes that they thought needed to be put in place. The Premier. 
Harper's lobbyists. I specifically like, had the meeting in order to elicit that Minister Speaker, I still stand ready to hear their uh, their input on the substance of what they think should be in the legislation, Mr. Speaker. And we will bring in we will bring in two pieces of legislation, as I told them. We'll bring in the legislation in the spring around the fundraising rules, but then in the fall, Mr. Speaker, we will bring in another piece of legislation that will deal with other elections. Uh, so I'm I'm open to their suggestions, Mr. Speaker, and I have said that there may be changes to the uh, to the lobbying process that need to be put in place. I'd be happy to hear their concrete suggestions. Thank you. No Mr. Speaker, the notion that input is welcome is laughable. The only direction we got from the Premier is that this process would be dictated by the Premier's office, run by the Liberal Party, and the opinions of everyone else doesn't count with this government. Now, I can tell you there are numerous examples of why we need to address lobbying reform. A senior staffer leaves the Energy Minister's office only to take a job with a renewable energy company seeking project approval from that same minister. During that time, he personally donates to the Liberal Party 194 times. This just it doesn't look right to the people of Ontario. It isn't right. They want rules. The people of Ontario want rules to be put into, put into place to protect the public's interests. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier commit to a lobbying cooling off period for former government staff? Yes or no? Do you support that concept? Thank you. You see it, please? Thank you. The member from Stormont of Dundask, Glen Gary. Um, no, you come to order. Premier. Premier. So I think it's time that the people of Ontario actually stood where the leader of the opposition stands. So do you support a ban on corporate donations? Yes or no? Yeah. Order, please. To the chair. I'm not kidding. Finish, please. Does the leader of the opposition support a ban on union donations? Yes, yes or no? Does the leader of the opposition support controls on third party advertising? Yes or no? Does the leader of the opposition believe that we need to reduce the maximum? Stop the clock. I'm. Uh, I'm charged with trying to make sure that the, the mood is reasonable. It's not helpful when, even if you're attempting to use third person, you point at someone and point. Uh, you're speaking to the chair. Point at me. <laughs> so, Speaker, I'd like to know if the Leader of the Opposition supports constraints on loans and loan guarantees. Yes or no? Uh, just, just when I'm able to get that directed, it starts on this side. You're not helpful either. Please finish. Wrap up. A speaker, and does the leader of the opposition believe that we need to reform Member from Prince Edward Hastings. election donations? Yes, yes or no? Let's get on with it, Thank speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, speaker. My question is for the premier. Uh, jails in Ontario are overcrowded and understaffed, and that means too many inmates and not enough correction workers. It's not hard to see that this is a, re a recipe for jails and a system that are unsafe for everyone. Riots and violence and even deaths have become the norm in this under this Liberal government's watch. But when it comes to the new PTSD legislation, the Premier left out bailiffs and probation and parole officers, even though all correction workers are doing their best in a system that is unsafe for them and for inmates. When, when will corrections workers and inmates actually see safe jails in this province? Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, again, I say to uh, the corrections officers, I'm, I'm pleased that they're here. I, I assume that the uh, leader of the third party would agree with our move to uh, hire 710 new correctional officers and 2,000 more over the next three years, Mr. Speaker, because we agree that there needs to be change in uh, in our correction system. It's why the Minister of uh, uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services is working on a transformation. And as
Um, as he said, we are working on supports like mental health supports, Mr. Speaker, making sure that there is training, making sure there's more staff so that the environment is safer, so that uh, corrections officers have a better environment within, within which to work, and also, Mr. Speaker, that we're creating a system that, uh, that will work to rehabilitate people so that they can be reintegrated into society. That has not been the focus, Mr. Speaker, certainly from the federal level. That has not been the, uh, the focus of corrections in this country. It is the focus of this government, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and that's the direction that the transformation is moving in. Well, Speaker, everybody sees the transformation that's happening in the correction system. It speaks volumes when the Premier's minister doesn't even seem to know what's going on in jails, not even the one in his own community, Speaker. Not only was he completely unaware, but he went on to deny the fact that inmates are forced to sleep in showers in the Ottawa Detention Centre. Not only is this inhumane, of course, but it creates an even more dangerous work environment for the corrections officers and workers in in the facility. After admitting that he was wrong, the minister then promised that inmates would no longer be sleeping in shower stalls anymore. Has the government fixed Ottawa's overcrowding speaker? Where did all those inmates go? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, on this side of the House, we are very much focused on working along with our correctional workers in making sure that we are bringing meaningful changes. Uh, last year, Speaker, was a t challenging year with labour negotiations, but Speaker. I will say to you that we have come a long way in terms of ensuring that there was no strike, that we were able to reach an agreement that all parties are, are satisfied with. Uh, but now, most importantly, Speaker, working together in ensuring that we can come up with a concrete action plan as to how we change the system. And what we really need to do, Speaker, in, from all members of this House, is to come up with those ideas. It's easy to point the problem, Speaker. We all know what the challenges in the system are. Our real, real opportunity, Speaker, which is in front of us, is to come up with those, yes, those long-lasting uh, uh, transformational changes that will ensure that we focus on rehabilitation and reintegration as Thank opposed you. to just punishing. Well, Speaker, instead of actually dealing with systemic issues, what we see is uh, things flaring up in London, in Hamilton, in Thunder Bay, Toronto South. The Liberals chose to put their focus on taking our correction, correction systems to the brink. This government spent millions of dollars getting ready for a strike instead of investing in solutions to fix the problems, regardless of what this minister claims. Speaker. The Liberal government has made this made in Ontario crisis. They made this crisis, and it is on their hands. And that is bigger than just one ministry speaker. Because, for example, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care cut psychiatric beds and mental health support. Minister of Agriculture, come to order. Please finish. And those vulnerable individuals often find their way into our justice and correction system. Speaker, Question. will the premier acknowledge that when she's cutting health care, cutting education, cutting social services, cutting public housing, she's creating brand new Thank problems you. in corrections? Thank you. Minister? Well, I think, Speaker, I, 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 the, the, this, this bluster undermines the, the good faith and, and goodwill that exists, uh, Speaker, uh, within our correctional system for the first time in a long, long time. Finish, please. Speaker, we, we have a, a, a good will and good working relationship for the first time in a long time uh, within the correctional system from all our partners, including community partners, to actually move forward and develop a concrete action plan that will change the system. Speaker, warehousing more individuals in a correctional system it is, is not the answer. What we need to really focus on is how do we better rehabilitate and reintegrate individuals answer. back in the community. We have a lot of work to do to undermine the 10 years of damage that the Harper government and, and, and the leader of the opposition brought into, the, into our system and to ensure
New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Does the Premier believe, Speaker, that the rules governing democratic fairness should be made fairly and democratically, or does she believe that one person and one party should be making all the rules? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, um, here's here's the process that we are uh, we're putting forward. Um, we will uh, we will introduce draft legislation. We'll introduce legislation in the spring, Mr. Speaker, uh, and then that legislation, instead of uh, instead of going to committee hearings after second reading, will actually go to committee hearings after uh, first reading if we can get agreement, Mr. Speaker, and that will allow for two rounds of consultation with uh, with people across the province. We will be able to. Uh, have uh, consultation and input throughout the summer and into the fall, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I look forward to that. There are many issues that many of the issues that I raised with the leaders of the uh, opposition parties and with the leader of the Green Party, hoping for input. I did get some input from the leader of the Green Party, Mr. Speaker. Looking for some input from the opposition leaders, but more than that, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking Answer. for input from people across the province, from experts, from academics, from uh, members of civil society, all those people that the leader of the third party thinks we should hear from. We're looking forward to that input, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when Mike Harris arbitrarily changed election rules in 1998, the member for St. Catharines said it was a, quote, anti-democratic strategy hatched in the back rooms, end quote. Dalton McGuinty said, quote, you can't change the rules of the games without the consent of all the players involved, end quote. Can the Premier explain why it's anti-democratic if Mike Harris does it, but if Liberals do it, it's nonpartisan and consultative. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, um, I, I understand that the leader of the third party is preoccupied with the process. On this side of the house, we want to get on with making the changes. So, uh, my question to the uh, to the leader of the third party is: Do you support? Does she support the ban on union donations? So I need people that are out of order. That's a yes or no question. Another yes or no question. Does the Leader of the Opposition support a ban on corporate donations? Yes or no? What about third party donation or third party uh, advertising rules how about maximum spending limits on third party advertising yes or no speaker do we need to reduce the maximum donation speaker we want a lead, an answer from the leader of the third party does she support it or does she not support it and how about answer is there support for restrictions and rules around loans and loan guarantees? Speaker, the people of this province Thank want us you. to get on with it, and so do we. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Liberals conveniently pretend not to get it. We need to get the big money out of politics, obviously. It's time to ban those corporate and union donations for sure. But we need to get there with a modicum of credibility, Speaker. That's the point. Deciding the rules for a democratic system in the Premier's office does not pass the smell test. End of story. It is an undemocratic process hatched in the back rooms. Will this Premier commit to an open, democratic process and a fast-moving panel that involves all the major political parties, civil society, academics, and non-partisan experts? The way it should be done in a true democracy, Speaker. The way it should be done. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the leader of the third party is talking again about process. On this side, we think it's time to move forward with changes that the people expect us to do. So, what I'd like to add, if I know is, does the leader of the third party believe that we need a reduction in overall spending limits in election periods and between elections, Speaker? Yes or no? Do, does the leader of the third party believe that we need new leadership and nomination campaign spending limits and donation rules? Yes or no? Yes. Speaker, the time has come to move on with it. We have a perfectly democratic process in, through this legislature where we've uh, determined we're going to get lots of input. 
steps in a timely manner because we want this work to be done. Thank you. To the question, the member from Chatham, Ken Essex. Thank you, uh, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. You know, over the past few weeks, many were shocked to learn that inmates were being housed in showers at the Ottawa Carleton Detention Centre. What's even more shocking is that the minister had to backtrack after he had denied that such conditions existed. The community advisory report that the ministry sat on for months last year directly called on the minister to address overcrowding in the jail. Speaker, why did the minister ignore all evidence for so long that Ontario correction system is in crisis and it's leading to chaos in corrections. Every week. Speaker, uh, Speaker, let me be, be absolutely clear. It is totally unacceptable to uh, to house any inmate in any shower jails. cell. As soon as I found out that that, that practice have taken place, I uh, issued a, a directive to ensure that uh, that practice is permanently, uh, permanently uh, put to end. Uh, in addition, Speaker, in order to deal with some of the challenges that are taking place at the Ottawa Carlton Detention Centre, I have uh, created a task force that, which is being led uh, by my Deputy Minister. Speaker, the, the task force had its first meeting just uh, yesterday. It has, uh, of course, members from my ministry, uh, but in addition, Speaker, it also has representation from, from the union. Uh, it has community uh, members, such as from Elizabeth Fry Society and, uh, and the Mothers Offering Mutual Support. Uh, group, uh, members from Answer. the Community Advisory Board, in addition, Speaker, the Crown and Defence Council, so that we can work together, Speaker, and create both near-term and long-term solutions. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, Minister, deplorable conditions just don't appear overnight. The crisis in corrections may have been avoided if government officials simply listened to the police for help coming from the front lines. When I raised the question about safety issues at the Toronto South Detention Centre, staff were immediately issued a warning memo on confidentiality. And Speaker, that's unacceptable. Yeah. Safety concerns raised by frontline staff throughout Ontario must be welcomed and encouraged. Instead, we have a government that has tried unsuccessfully to muzzle correctional staff. So, Speaker, my question is simply this. Will the minister show leadership and apologize on behalf of his ministry for trying to, to silence correctional staff who tried desperately to get this Question. government to address safety concerns. Uh, speaker, uh, as I said earlier, we, we are very much interested in, in developing solutions together. And I sincerely, Speaker, I sincerely ask the member opposite, I know he, he intends well, uh, to provide solutions. Let's work together uh, to deal with this very complex problem uh, in a manner that brings everybody together. If, uh, speaker, time. his solution is, as, he, as his party has suggested in the past, to privatize jails. I, we absolutely reject that notion, Speaker. That is not where we're going to go. We need to work together to, uh, along with our correctional workers to find meaningful fa uh, uh, ways not only to reduce spe uh, speaker uh, overcrowding in our jails by reforming the bail system, and the federal government has a very important role to play, but also in making sure that we've got appropriate supports Order. within our correctional institutions, but in also in our community se uh, setting by, by benefiting from Answer. the expertise of our probation and parole officers so that we can ensure better reintegration. Speaker, we welcome ideas and solutions. Let's work together together and make it happen. Thank you. The member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This question is to the Premier. The Premier wrote her plan for how all elections will be financed by herself at home two days before she met with the opposition members. It's not clear she even consulted with her own caucus. She hasn't consulted with experts. She hasn't consulted with civil society, and she certainly hasn't listened to Ontarians. Why is she stubbornly refusing a process that includes all major political parties, civil society, and nonpartisan experts, and instead choosing to go it alone? Thank you. 
No, Mr. Speaker, I've known the member for Kitchener Waterloo for a very long time. She used to be a school community advisor with the Toronto Board of Education. Uh, I know she worked in community very well, and I know that she understands how process works. I know she understands that when there are important decisions to be made, everybody needs to do their work. Everybody needs to look at the options. Everybody needs to come forward with a synthesis of the ideas that they have looked at, and then to sound those out with other people and then come up with uh, a solution, Mr. Speaker. And so I'm really surprised that the member, this member, who understands that so well, wouldn't understand that we all have to have, we all have to do this work. Every one of us who wants to have input into this process has to think about what the options are, Mr. Speaker, has to consider those options, and then has to enter into a broader process. Answer. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We're going to bring legislation forward. We're expanding the consultation period. We want to hear input from people around the province, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. and we would love to hear with. You say that, please. You say that, please. Just when I was ready to admonish. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, let's remember, in the 2016 budget, the Premier established a number of new panels. In the past, this Premier created panels on how many bottles of beer someone can buy and where they can buy them. The word consultation appears in the 2016 budget more than 50 times. Clearly, the problem isn't that the Premier refuses to hold consultations or conversations or doesn't like independent panels. She needs to remember that our democracy, democracy belongs to all of us, not the Liberal Party. Explain to Ontarians why she thinks she alone should be making the rules for our democracy functions and why she is stubbornly refusing an open, transparent consultation by establishing a fast moving, moving independent panel on election fairness. Mr. Speaker, I, I do think that there should be a democratic process, and I think that having the legislative process, putting the legislative process in place on. Is the democratic process, Mr. Speaker? It is exactly the democratic process that we're proposing be used. And I think the third party, by suggesting that that the the process in this legislature to, from uh, to put Bay. policy forward is not democratic, is a pretty outrageous statement, Mr. Speaker. I think that the third party doesn't want to talk about the substance. I think that the third party wants to talk about process and because delay. they don't want to talk about the uh, the substance because they want to delay, Mr. Speaker. I want to make sure. That we have a process in place that allows us to move the January 1, 2017, to have those rules in place. I think the third party wants Answer. to delay beyond that. We're not going to do that. Yeah. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. The Child Care and Early Years Act provides a new legislative framework to increase access and oversight in Ontario's child care sector. Minister, it is important for our government to give children the best possible start in life. I was surprised to hear the concerns from my constituents about changes to ratios and regulations that would impact families. Constituents in my riding of York South Western are raising concerns about the proposed changes to the child care regulations. Speaker, through you to the minister, could she please tell us and tell everyone in this house what our government is doing to address these concerns? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And thank you uh, to the member for York South Western for the question. The proposed regulatory changes were posted for public feedback from February 1st to April 1st of this year. During this period, we engaged with families and stakeholders and did receive extensive feedback on the proposed regulations. I want to assure you and everyone else here this morning, Speaker, that we have heard the concerns raised, and I want to be clear that the regulations as posted will not 
be implemented. We will be taking another look at some of the proposed regulations and we'll be engaging with our sector, the child care sector, on a plan moving forward that makes changes to reflect the concerns that have been voiced. So we will continue to consult and revisit Answer. what changes need to be made in the future. Thank you. you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. It is reassuring to hear that the concerns of my constituents in your southwestern are being taken seriously. I know how important it is for our government to continue to provide high quality and safe childcare. I'm well aware that our government wants to ensure that we are increasing access to childcare for families across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, could the minister through you tell us how uh, else our government will continue to modernize Ontario's child care and early years uh, system. And how can uh, we ensure that the concerns of my constituents of, and other families in Ontario's continue to be heard? Thank you. Minister. Yes, and thank you, Speaker. Since 2003, our government has doubled child care funding to more than $1 billion annually. The number of licensed child care spaces in Ontario has grown to nearly 351,000 spaces, an increase of 87 per cent in the number of licensed spaces. We're also creating 4,000 new child care spaces as a result of a $120 million capital investment over three years to construct new child care spaces in new schools. But I do want to be clear. The regulation on the ratios as posted will not be implemented. Order. There will changes be, will be made, and we will ensure that there are Answer. options for parents. We have heard the concerns that have been raised, and we will work with the sector to find a Thank solution. You. Yeah. Thank you. New question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Uh, my question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. On July 28, 2015, WPD Canada filed a court application about its proposed project to build eight 500-foot-high wind turbines near the Collingwood Airport. They wanted the court to force the Ministry of Environment to make a decision on their project. WPD had gotten tired of waiting, Mr. Speaker. On September 22, the government filed a notice with the court saying it intended to fight the application. Two days later, on September 24, the Ontario Liberal Party deposited a donation from WPD in the amount of $6,000. The court application never went ahead, and the ministry approved the project in February of this year. Oh. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us why the Liberal Party was accepting donations from WPD while it was Question. fighting the company in court? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's just first break this down. The process involved in this involves a director's level decision which i do not and cannot interfere with and as i said to the me member from prince edward hastings it's our job to protect the integrity of the system it then goes to the environmental review tribunal another in finish please so it's fairly clear and transparent process second mr speaker we have some of the strongest fundraising rules in Canada across this country anyway. And you know, and I've said this before, Mr. Speaker, I know all 107 members of this House reasonably well. I know them to be honourable people who are decent people who came here to be honest, to work with yes, integrity sir. and serve their, their people. And to suggest otherwise is just really, really, really low, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Some of the comments I heard were not. I wish I could assign them to somebody, because I would. Supplementary. Back to the uh, minister. That six thousand dollar donation is the largest single donation that WPD had ever given to the Liberal Party. In March of 2014, the ministry asked WPD for an updated report on their wind turbine application. That same month, WPD donated three thousand dollars to the Liberal Party, their second largest donation. Two months later, in May, WPD submitted that updated report to the ministry, and that same month, WPD donated a further $2,000 to the Liberal Party, Deputy House third largest donation. 
Every time it looked like the project was in jeopardy, a donation was made to the Liberal Party of Ontario. These facts, Mr. Speaker, only reinforce the need for a public inquiry. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, does the minister seriously expect the people in my riding to believe that these donations had absolutely nothing to do with his approval of the WPD? Thank you. Uh, there's uh, some very large temptations to speak while I'm standing and while I've gotten people's attention, and it's going to stop. Minister. The short answer is yes, Mr. Speaker. And the second part of this, let's go back to the process. So the member who's a former member, Minister of the Environment knows how bulletproof these processes are. MO, MOECC conducting one of its most comprehensive reviews to ensure WD's WDP's proposal would meet our stringent requirements. The Ontario Renewable Energy Approval Process ensures extensive consultation take place with the public, Aboriginal groups, and local governments. And we extended a six-month review over two years and considered 350 public and agency uh, submissions, Mr. Speaker. And finally, again, at the point I made earlier, uh, that these these decisions are made by by uh, public officials. And Mr. Speaker, to be very clear about this, I have been in public life municipally and provincially. I've, I've conducted myself Answer. to a very high personal standard. And I know the member officer, Mr. Speaker. I know him to be as a person of great character, and I know him Thank because you. he was a minister before, and I hope he starts. Thank you. General reminder to all members, to the chair. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Advocate for Public Health Care released a new report this morning called Ontario's Hospitals Cut Beyond All Limits. I think the title says it all. It lays out in painstaking details the full extent of the liberal cuts to Ontario Hospital. The work of the Ontario Health Coalition confirms what patients are seeing across our province. Under this Premier's watch, the crisis of cuts inside our hospital is getting worse. Hundreds of nurses and frontline hospital workers laid off. Hospital beds closed. In rural community, forced to fight just to keep the doors open and the lights on in their own local hospital. People want to know, Speaker, why is this Premier so determined to, Question. to keep cutting hospital care? Well, Mr. Speaker, what I'm determined to do is to uh, build up our health care system to make sure that our health care system uh, serves the people of this Democrats province with the right health care in a timely way where they need it. So we have to look at the whole health care system, Mr. Speaker, and hospitals are a very, very important part of that, which is why there's $345 million more of new money in, the, uh, in this year's budget for the hospital sector, Mr. Speaker. But beyond that, there is a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, more money, new money that we're putting into uh, into healthcare, into the whole system. And again, I know that the uh, the member of the third party understands that this, the healthcare system is it's under transition. There's no there's no doubt about that. It's changing. The way healthcare is being delivered is changing. Uh, there are community services available now that were not available in the past, and there's more of that that is necessary, Mr. Speaker. So we do have to look at the the system Thank as you. a whole. The Premier likes to deny that any hospital cuts are happening under her watch, but the Premier is fooling no one, Speaker. Patients, family, frontline hospital workers and administrators, as well as local health coalition, we all see right through the Liberals' talking points. St. Joseph Health Centre in, in London says that they have seen almost $36.5 million cut over the last four years under this Liberal government. And all those cuts means bed closure, longer wait time for patients, and fewer frontline nurses and health care workers. Mm -hmm. When services are cut in our hospital, they get privatized in the community. They are not available. They are not accessible. They have no oversight. It begs the question, why is this hospital putting is this premier putting hospital in the terrible position of making decisions based on dollars and Question. deficit rather than the best for patients and their families? Well, 
question, Mr. Speaker. I guess I would, I would say back to the uh, member of the third party, why is she not talking about the whole health care system? Why is she not talking about the way health care delivery is changing? She is a health care provider, Mr. Speaker. I would think she would understand that people who are in the community who need care, Mr. Speaker, want that care in their homes. They want it through uh, community delivery services, Mr. Speaker, as opposed to putting all of that, that onus on the hospital. And Mr. Speaker, I think that I think that given given the heckling that's coming from the third party right now, they actually recognize. You can hide, but I can still catch it. The, the, the fact that uh, since 2003 there are 5,600 more doctors in the system. Uh, finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know we have uh, we have paramedics who are in the uh, in the the legislature today, Mr. Speaker. I think they recognize that there are changes happening in the system that are necessary in order for us to deliver 21st century health care. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sports. Over the past few weeks, we have seen Bill 100, the Supporting Ontario's Trail Act, repeatedly criticized by the opposition parties based on misconceptions related to the trail easements. Numerous times, the minister has said that an easement pursuant to Bill 100, if passed, will be a voluntary agreement between a landlord and an eligible body or bodies. Mr. Don McCabe, the, Ontario, uh, the OFA president, has said that Bill 100 does not encroach on the freedom of individual landowners. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he tell this House more about the trail easements? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member from Trinity Spadina for the question. Uh, trails easements under Bill 100 are volunteer, voluntary and will not alter existing land use agreements. And it surprises me that many of the members opposite Mr. Speaker have gone on record saying that this is actually a threat to trails here in the province of Ontario, but yet our stakeholders have repeat, repeatedly told this government that Bill 100 is a wonderful bill. The Niagara Escarpment Commission, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters have said they are fully supportive of this bill. Bruce Ta Trail has told us trail easements are a very useful tool that will cut years of bureaucratic red tape. This is just another example, Answer. Mr. Speaker, of the progressive conservatives being out of touch of the, with the people of Ontario, and I hope the opposition will get on side to support Bill Don't waste it. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister uh, for clarifying this issue. Uh, I cannot stress enough how important Bill 100 is to Ontario. Mr. Speaker, trail tourism contributes $1.4 billion to our economy each year. That number includes over $800 million in labour income, which supports an estimate 18,000 jobs across the province. Bill 100 is intended to grow the trail sector by connecting and expanding trails across the province, including the economic benefit for local communities such as mine in Trinity Spadina. There have been questions on whether we did enough consultations on Bill 100. Through you to the minister. Could the minister tell us the number, the, tell the member of this house how we consulted on Bill 100? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for Trinity Spadina for the question. I know he's a huge supporter of trails here in the province of Ontario. In fact, the Bill Davis Trail recently opened up in Trinity Spadina. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, to develop Bill 100, our ministry held uh, broad in-person consultations right across the entire province. We engaged with uh, groups like the Eastern Ontario Trails Alliance, Simcoe County Trails, Simcoe. the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs, the Bruce Trail uh, Conservancy, Conservancy, the Ontario Native Women's Association, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. We consulted with Order. 80 municipalities, Mr. Speaker, with Indigenous groups, with landowners, trail organizations from all across Ontario. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we consulted with over 250 different groups here in Ontario. I think our government's done an excellent job at Member from Prince Edward Hastings, second time. New question. The member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Yesterday, Ontario Gaming East announced it would be relocating the slots at Kawartha Downs in my riding to Peterborough and building a new casino. Oh, oh, the surprise. township of Cabin Monaghan will lose $3 million in annual slot revenues to fix roads and bri bridges, which will only continue to strain the small budget of my municipality. You know, this government loves to talk about infrastructure, yet now that my township is faced with losing significant slot revenues, this government won't bat an eye. Speaker, will the minister tell my municipality where they are supposed to find the three million that his government has now ripped out of their budget? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Halliburton Court Lakes Brock uh, for a question this morning. But let me give the member a little history. Member from Kitchener Waterloo will come to order. Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me give the member a little history lesson. I remember when I was a city councillor in Peterborough in 1997 98. We had started talks with annexation uh, with that municipality uh, to offer uh, a financial support as that process moved forward. Well, I'm not a member. Of City Council today, I understand in conversations with the Mayor of Peterborough, uh, Daryl Bennett, that there's been ongoing talks with that municipality regarding annexation proposals. Even though I'm not party to discussions, I'm told that the City of Peterborough Answer. has made very generous officer to that municipality for their future. been going on, but my discussion is that the OLG and the government have repeatedly said they were committed to the longer-term sustainability of the horse racing industry. You said that. Well, Kawartha Downs had 100 races and now has 18, but the loss That's of the slots the is going to ultimately close Kawartha Downs and the horse racing will be gone. So in 2013, the very minister said that he had a plan to maintain a share of slot revenues to support the horse racing industry. Yesterday's announcement shows the minister has no plan. So, Mr. Speaker, were the bright lights and allure of a shiny new casino in his riding just too hard for the minister to resist? Minister. If the member <laughs> Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the member should do her homework. She should sit down with the municipal representatives of Cavan Bonnegan to find out the generous offer that the city of Peterborough put on the table to that municipality to sustain their finances for the future to come. When it comes to horse racing, Mr. Speaker, the only time that member ever showed up at Fourth and Downs was when they thought they were going to close it. That's the only she was ever up there. Yeah. 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 That one actually had hurt my ear. Hurt yours too? Just saying. Just saying. Uh, the minister has one sentence. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, John Stoblet, Albert Buchanan, and John Wilkinson put forward a path 
for sustainable horse race in the province of Ontario. It was never supported by any of those. <laughs> New question. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Today, I'm asking the Premier to do the math. I'm asking her to estimate the minimum monthly income needed for a single person to live a healthy, dignified life in our province. In her estimation, what is the bare minimum needed to afford the basics like nutritious food, safe and decent housing and clothing, to have access to transportation, a telephone? What does it cost for a single person to live in places like Timmins or Hamilton or Wapiscat? or right in her own riding of Don Valley West. How much does the Premier imagine this cost? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from ha Hamilton East Stony Creek for his interest in social assistance. I really welcome this. And, of course, we will be debating his private member's bill tomorrow. Uh, and I look forward to having 50 minutes uh, in this House to talk about the most vulnerable in our society. Of course, as the member has referenced, rates are extremely important, and this is why, of course, we have been increasing rates consistently over the last here, number here, of here, years. Here, here, here. And in this year's budget, we really did take the unprecedented step of saying that uh, there would no longer be a claw clawback of child support here, here. payments. Here, here. We uh, intend, Mr. Speaker, to take a very comprehensive look at social assistance reform in a, in in a way, it's a whole-of-government uh, uh, way of looking at how we can support our most vulnerable people. We will be looking at employment incentives, Thank you. training, a number of different areas. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. With all due respect, unfortunately, it's no surprise that the Premier can't give me an estimate. This go government simply does not understand the daily challenges faced by people trying to pay the bills in Ontario. It's time, it's time, Speaker, to do the math. During this government's time in office, Speaker, Order. the poorest people in Ontario have got poorer. Food banks are overflowing. People on social assistance programs, including people with chronic disabilities, unable to participate in the labour market, have less real income today than they had under Mike Harris. New Democrats believe that governments must make evidence-based public policy. We believe that we need a social assistance benefits that actually reflect the real costs of living. Will the Premier take the politics out of social assistance? Will the Premier commit to ensuring social assistance policy is based in evidence? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is really refreshing to hear from the new New Democratic Party their interest in these important matters. I seem to recall that the 2014 election platform, you will recall the nine pages, never once mentioned the most vulnerable in our society. We never saw any support for our increasing of the minimum wage. We haven't seen support for the child benefit in all the aspects that we have taken, all the initiatives that we've taken to improve the lives of the most vulnerable in our society, and also to address again the way we are going to address this very important issue is that we're going to look across the spectrum of supports for people in social assistance. In fact, in this budget, we also saw the free tuition for post we're going to look at health benefits. We're going to look at housing. Uh, we have some very important initiatives that this Thank government you. has introduced, and we will continue in this way. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, come to order. Start the clock. Member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. 
Minister, in looking around this place today, we all recognize the International Day of Pink, a day where we recognize anti-bullying initiative that began in Nova Scotia after a grade 9 student was bullied in his school for wearing pink. Two students who witnessed the incident spot pink shirts to stand united with the student against bullying. Now, many schools run events on the Day of Pink, including in my riding of Cambridge and Waterloo Region. When my son Liam was co-president of Southwood Secondary School, he and his friends had their fingernails and painted pink as well as their faces as a challenge, and he organized events, including a play about the effects of bullying for the students. It's important that we continue to stand together and create awareness, not only today, but every day. Speaker, can the minister tell this House how we ensure that our students feel safe and respected at schools across our province? Thank you, Minister of Education. Well, thank you to the member, and I'm just going to have to go to Southwood and check out all these pink faces and fingernails. Sounds like fun. But our schools must be places where everyone, staff, students, parents, and the community feel welcome, safe, and respected. And that's why I'm proud of the Accepting Schools Act. This act is Canada's most comprehensive anti-bullying legislation, and as part of its definition of bullying speaker, it also includes cyberbullying. School safety has been a priority for this government from the beginning, and that's why we require all school boards to have policies on bullying prevention and intervention. Our government has Answer. invested $425 million in safe schools initiatives that are helping make Ontario's schools safer. Thank in you. fact, this year, 65 Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for commitment on this important issue. We're extremely proud of the investments made towards educating not only our students, but parents and staff. For the first time ever, we have defined bullying in legislation so that every student, teacher, principal and parent knows what we're talking about when we say that bullying is not okay in our schools. Minister, in 2015, you re introduced the revised health and physical education curriculum to better reflect the advancement of technology, making information readily available to students. I've had many of my constituents in Cambridge speak positively about this new curriculum, noting that the previous curriculum was written well before the use of cell phones and the internet was prevalent around students. In fact, my oldest two children didn't have cell phones till they reached university. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell us about the benefits of the revised curriculum sure. and how it's helping our students navigate in today's technology-driven world? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, the reality is that we want our children to be safe and healthy, but we also want to ensure that they have access to accurate information. So that's why we needed to update our health and phys ed curriculum so that students understand the importance of healthy relationships, having the confidence to say no, safe use of technology and the internet, and mental health. The revised curriculum offers increased support, acceptance, and visibility for LGBTQ and Two-Spirit children and youth. We're also working, Speaker, to ensure that our students have the opportunity to learn more about online safety through the revised curriculum. Yes, students are learning about safe and respectful use of technology, the social, emotional, and legal implications of online Thank behavior you. such as... Thank you. No question. The member from Holland, Norfolk. To the Premier, uh, ten months ago, all parties in this House supported the Private Members' Bill, Provincial Framework, and Action Plan concerning vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, and I, I thank everyone for that support. Part of the legislation was a requirement to develop a provincial framework and to develop the action plan within a year. Lime tick season is now upon us. Speaker. Will the Premier now please report to the House and to the victims of this awful affliction progress to date, what's being done? Thank you. 
So, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I appreciate the, I appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. I will say I don't have the information on what has, uh, what has happened uh, uh, so far, Mr. Speaker. I know that, I know that uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want, to, uh, will want to speak to him when he returns. He is, as you know, Mr. Speaker, he is in Attawapiskat today with the Minister of Children and Youth Services, and uh, we'll certainly get back to the uh, member opposite with an update. That's where yeah. should be. Thank you. The member from Hamilton Mountain on a point of order. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I missed introductions earlier, and I see a dear friend up, up in the top, so I'd like to welcome to Queen's Park today with Opsu Lorraine Stitch. Welcome. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 173, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and or amend various statutes. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
members, please take their seats. All members, please take your seats. Please. On April 12, 2016, Mr. Sousa moved third reading of Bill 173, an act to implement budget measures and to enact or amend various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame, Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynne. Ms. Wynne. Mr. Mayor. 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 M